Well, welcome everyone to today's webinar titled, Make Your Data Work for You, The Changing Role of Treasury in Receivables. This is Brian from Strategic Treasurer, and we're pleased you could join us as we discuss the power of data and how Treasury can move from service provider to strategic partner. But before I introduce today's speakers, I have just a few quick announcements. Zoom offers several different ways for us to interact today. If you would like to post comments or questions viewable by all attendees, please use the chat icon in the toolbar. If you would like to ask your question to just the presenters, please use the Q&A icon in the toolbar. You can ask your questions at any time during the presentation, and we'll try to get to as many as we can, but if we don't get to your question, someone from our team will gladly follow up with you. There will also be a few polling questions throughout today's webinar where you'll be able to select your response from a list of multiple choices. You will need to click the Submit button on the polling questions to have your response recorded. If you are here for CPE credits, you will need to answer at least three polls today. And last, please ensure that your Zoom display name includes both your first and last name so we'll know to whom we should send the credits. Our speakers for today are Patrick Moy, Executive Director of Receivables at Deluxe, and Craig Jeffrey, Founder and Managing Partner of Strategic Treasurer. Welcome, Pat and Craig, and I'll now turn the presentation over to you. Thanks so much, Brian. Thank you, everyone, for joining. I know uh, you have a lot of things to do. You have a busy life. We're glad you're spending an hour with us. Pat, I'm uh, glad to talk with you on this topic about making data work for you. Yeah, it's going to be a fun one, and, and it's a pretty evolving landscape, so excited to get into it. I was uh, I was pleased to learn that he also lives in the greater Atlanta area, and I just found that out 10 minutes ago. So. Um, we could have we could have done it in the same office. So, um, but uh, thanks thanks so much, everyone, for joining. Let let me go through our agenda for today. We've got quite a bit of content, stories, poll questions, uh, everything. So the first um, the first item here is Treasury's potential. So this is moving from a vendor to a strategic partner. And so we think about the potential as a vendor is someone who just buys things or secures services and acts like a vendor, a partner is one who looks across the organization, helps it helps the organization to meet its goals. And this is where we're talking about a, a, a strategic partner, uh, a treasurer who looks across both accounts receivable, accounts payable, across the whole cash conversion cycle. And this is where value is found for the organization, financial value and value in data, which uh, does a feedback loop to financial value. So that's the Taking the broad view uh, has significant uh, value uh, from a partner partnering approach. From data, we'll look at uh, it's the new currency, uh, how it's important, how it's used in the organization. It's a way of driving value within your organization and to your other business partners. So we'll look and spend some time there. What are the pitfalls with data and how to avoid pitfalls of the other two topics? So when we think about pitfalls with data, Data can sometimes be separated. It can be handed off. It can be disconnected. We can only think about data that we need in this one part of the process as opposed to the rest of the process. So the pitfalls, the sources of those pitfalls, and how do we avoid those pitfalls tends to tie together. So taking this more comprehensive, broad look, or what we may refer to sometimes as end-to-end -end within our organization, an end-to-end -end look, to our organization and the our counterparties' organizations being an end-to-end, two-end-to-end look, a co complete look at the process. That's where there's financial value. That's where there's value with data. Uh, that's how we can make data work for us. So in the moving forward with data, it'll continue that discussion about how we can take that broader view and use it. Then we'll wrap up with a small group of takeaways, the new data value. Uh, how we don't want to get rid of the old data and the old ways of doing things, but we want to extend on those uh, with some new approaches. And then we'll also summarize again with that end-to-end -end view, why we see and find value. So that's that's our agenda. That's our topic topics for today, uh, what we're going to cover. So I'll start off this slide and then turn it over to Pat. But this is this is that view of 
can treasury be a vendor or a strategic partner? A vendor does what? Here's, here's what you needed. Here's the cash you needed. Uh, you've required a service. I gave you that service. Maybe I protected risk. But a strategic business partner looks at the entire process. How do I manage working capital, the cash conversion cycle? How do I advise the business from a risk perspective, from an efficiency perspective? How do we make sure that our, our goals, our objectives, our metrics are aligned? And so it's uh, acting as a very helpful partner, not just saying I'm meeting a particular individual need. I'm not looking broadly to I'm looking at what's most helpful for the organization. I'm leveraging my strengths to help others, just like each person, each area. So whether you're from accounts payable, you're from treasury, you're from accounts receivable, maybe you're from procurement, each of those, we each benefit from taking that strategic partner approach. Me coming from treasury, I laid it out more from treasury as a strategic partner. Pat, I'd love, I'd love for you to weigh in here too. Yeah, it's a, it's a really important topic to start with because it's the goal we, we all have, right? We all want to play a more strategic role for the business. We all want to be able to um, really impact change and growth and looking at whatever objectives the overall business has, being able to contribute to that significantly. And what this this isn't meant to represent is saying that those jobs as a vendor, right? Those those services provided aren't important. They're they're critically important to the business being able to function and and operate. This is really about time spent, right? It's really about level of effort. It's about where. Um, you can can leverage technology or data or whatever is at your disposal to minimize time spent in the activities that are uh, more in that sort of vendor category that are value add to the business, but not necessarily taking your unique skill sets and you know, the way you you solve problems or process things uh, and applying that unique skill set to where the business needs help um, in, in those more strategic areas. So I, I like to think about it less from a, you know, what jobs are more important than others. It's more about what jobs require you and your skill set and what you bring to the table and how do we unlock that value differently because we're able to, to minimize the level of effort spent on the more service-oriented uh, pieces of, of the day-to-day -day work in, in Treasury? So one of the things that we, we really like to frame this up with is on the surface, the the um the simple view at the top here is what the outside world sees as our day-to-day -day, really right um there's a buyer and they pay for goods and services rendered and what you know everybody looks at from the outside whether it's customers whether it's investors other other stakeholders in the business that's what they see and that's what they want to see right um, it's the proverbial duck on the pond, right? Steadily moving along. But we all know that that comprehensive view underneath that is the, the feet that are constantly churning to keep us afloat, right? And within that comprehensive view, you see there's all these systems in place, processes, people, structures, everything that's been built over time on both uh, both ends of the the cash conversion cycle right whether it's you know on the buyer side the systems they're using um, from an accounts payable standpoint or on the seller side the systems they're using from a receivable standpoint everything out there is built in a way that's trying to enable that process to happen and generating tons and tons of data every step of the way. And one of the challenges is, is that 
you know, the way that these systems have been built and processes have been put in place has typically been in a world where data wasn't necessarily a, a critical piece of the puzzle, right? It was more about how do we just make sure this money is flowing from point A to point B than it is about the data being able to unlock more value beyond just the value of the transaction itself. And I think that's one of the biggest shifts that we're seeing more and more of and where you know technology companies or, or, or companies that are on more of the, the leading edge of you know whether it's AI or other you know big data type institutions are realizing that the power comes from the ability to collect, capture all that data and do something with it. Right. And and that's the important piece of this and why we, you know, set the stage of this conversation is making your data work for you, because all of us have access to data. Right. All of us have different systems that are collecting data, they're generating reports, they're doing things that they were designed to do. But where that falls short is those those systems might have been more myopically looked at to say, you know, this is its job and this is the data it's going to produce. But it isn't necessarily looking at how interconnected it is to the full cash conversion cycle, right? And how we can think more end to end to be able to unlock the value of that data in new and different ways. And so when we think end to end, and that's, you know, sort of the, the next slide here, um, we look across, we all want to optimize our business, right? We all want to do things better, be more efficient, to drive change for the organization, to save money, to, you know, increase our ability to um, unlock capital faster, right? To reduce day sales outstanding, right? All those things that we want to do, um, are, are optimization strategies that are typically looked at within individual parts of the business. And uh, because we, we we talked about Atlanta, I can, you know, poke fun at, at Atlanta a little bit. You know, one of the things that I, I think about when thinking about these individual parts of the business is, you know, the if anybody's ever driven around Atlanta, you know how uh, some of our roads here don't make a ton of sense and they are uh, maybe optimized for the area that they're in, but don't really help you navigate across the city, right? They're maybe good within a neighborhood, but then they're sort of isolated to optimizing within that neighborhood. And if you're trying to get from one point of the city to the other, that neighborhood can actually uh, throw off your ability to have your entire journey be optimized. So it's one of the things that when we think about our, our business, taking a look at these individual parts and optimizing within is where we actually can fall short of the real impact we can have when we look across and try to find the spaces to optimize as a whole, we have an opportunity to move more away from the optimization of tactics to the optimization of those strategic partner capabilities. So Craig, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to to that. Well, besides you shouldn't pick on Atlanta roads, but um, <laughs> no, the, the, the uh, you know, that, that there's that quote, you know, if you, um, if you optimize part of the process, you suboptimize the whole. And if anyone hears me talk any length of time, I, I love that quote. It's attributed to different people and to anonymous, but that top uh, that top section is that it's that section of the the road for the town, right? Treasury or AR, or trading partner, or AP. You just you you optimize the handoffs for what's in your area of control, and you don't look at the bigger picture. The bottom chart on this that that the dashed rectangle on the bottom says we look at the entire process and want to optimize it for all trading partners because there's a negative feedback loop, right? If I 
don't send the right information or create some inappropriate process, the other area is going to be contacting me because they don't know what to do. <clears throat> it's a it's a bad handoff. And it's like, I don't know if you want to call it like, you know, there's those uh, relay races and track and field where there's a lot with how well the baton is passed. Um, you can lose races there. You can have great runners, but if the baton is poor, uh, poorly passed off, you, uh, you're never going to win the race. You need to have good runners and good handoffs. That's really the, that's just another way of looking at the, the road, uh, analogy, the, um, business process analogy or the track and field analogy, but just a couple things there. So yeah, thanks for your explanation on that. And everybody, if you would pay attention to the screen, it might be behind uh, the image that you're looking at. It's our first poll question is up. This is a select a single choice. So you get to pick one and then hit submit once you've filled in the circle of your choice. Our focus on the business process is most accurately described as end to end internal and external parties. That's the end to end to end to end. The next one is end to end, just focused on internal processes. Let's say within our company and then the, within the particular function, AR, AP, treasury, procurement, whatever. And then the last one is, I am not sure. Um, sometimes you don't include that, uh, but we did today just to cycle those people. Like maybe you're new to the company. You don't know what the focus is on the process, but go ahead and enter that, submit it. Now, um, we are going to um, say that uh, if we have, well, let's just say 150, that's a small percentage. If people type the word deluxe with the E at the end, um, or they type in poll, we will send all the poll results to you at the end, to everybody, not just those who type it in, but we have to get, we have to get 150. So please type it in the webinar chat as opposed to the Q&A box. Yep. We'll go from there. It's fun to see that scroll up on the screen. All right. So here are the answers, uh, Pat. So um, this is a pretty uh, pretty good group. Um, we've got 45% with the, the comprehensive look, 21% just on internal side then the particular function maybe that's the most honest group but uh, that's another 21 percent and then 13 percent i'm not sure um you know as you look at this any any comments or thoughts about those answers or about taking a look at this broader view yeah i well first of all i, I love to see the majority of folks in here already thinking end to end um you know i, I spend a lot of time um in the product world thinking end to end from a customer experience standpoint where you know it's not just about their time using the the product it's about what happens before and after they use the product too so you know thinking end to end in terms of these these business processes um you know i i i think the more companies that can do that the you know the better off that they're going to be because you you end up you're able to you know plot things you're able to see shortcomings right you're able to to sort of map out the whole field of view and give yourselves the space to optimize right so i i appreciate that so many of you are already there and and i i get excited about that because I think as we get into the next topics here, what I hope is that you'll see opportunities to leverage where you're already positioned, looking end to end, and think about how to attack it in, in some, some new ways. Excellent. So we'll close that, uh, that poll response. Um, thanks so much for taking the poll. I think most people type the word poll, less type deluxe. But uh, Brian will keep us on track with where our numbers are. All right. Um, yeah, let's let's continue that discussion, Pat. Um, you know, foundational pitfalls. Um, yeah. This is the data last approach, just data first. <laughs> yeah, and and you know, unfortunately, one of the things that that I've seen in this space is 
you know, technology um, has, has left behind some of the systems we use, some of the processes we use. Um, and it's caused a, a pretty big gap in between what things are actually available for us to optimize our end-to-end -end processes and tools. Um, but, you know, what, what really ends up happening is we spend most of our time and energy on the, the symptoms that are often generated by, you know, shortcomings from a, a data standpoint. So when I, when I think about time spent, right back to my initial comment, um, the the symptoms are what are obvious right the inefficient liquidity slow slow pay defects issues in in the process all of these things are very visible right they're things that we see they're things that we um, have mechanisms in place to have conversations around to try to address um, not only are they visible uh to to you all they're also visible at senior leadership levels, right? These are the things that get a ton of time and attention because when we, you know, generally as, as humans think about problems and, and things to, to solve, we typically look at how to address issues and don't spend as much time on what the actual issue is. And I think that this is, this slide really, for me, encompasses how, you know, we can look across the end-to-end, -end, you know, cash conversion cycle. We can have all of our systems in place to um, be able to identify slow pay or defects or, or issues that are, are driving um, inefficient liquidity. We can have the conversations about them. There are fire drills that come up that we have to go out and, and, and solve. But a lot of times it's because the, some of our data processes and some of our um, practices around how data is captured or used is really the cause of a lot of those downstream impacts, right? Whether it's, you know, within some of our processes, there's manual steps um, and those manual steps are tracked manually, right? There's correspondence that happens on, you know, a customer that's that's uh, paying slow. There's correspondence that happens on phone calls or emails that doesn't get tracked, right? There's handoffs between systems where data is lost in transit, right? Or, um, you know, some some data might get stripped out when it moves from one system to another. And all of those things are leading to those those symptoms that you see on the right there. All of those things are con contributing factors to um, the gaps that we're trying to fill and the gaps that we're trying to solve. But typically what, what I've seen is companies are really talking more about, you know, how do we drive efficiency so we can, you know, get paid faster and trying to optimize within, you know, those symptom spaces instead of taking the step back and saying, well, what data are we actually capturing here? How are we capturing it? Where is it captured? What are we using it for? How are these reports enabled? Um, you know, I, I think about the, you know, I, I do a lot of customer research as, as part of this. And, and I remember um, an interview I had with the uh, CFO of a, um, a manufacturing company, mid-market manufacturing company. And we were talking about you know some of those those symptoms on the right there. We were talking about tools that that he used for um, trying to reduce time to pay, and 
then we got deeper into like where all of the data is that helps him make those decisions. And it was all in these Excel spreadsheets. It was all in either, you know, hard uh, uh, physical files or people's memory, right? And you would have to go and call up, you know, one of the specialists on the team to say, why is this customer behind in paying? And technically, you were able to solve for slow pay by using some of those methods. We all have, you know, figured out the shortcomings of our systems to fill some of those gaps. But the companies that can look at solving that cause, having tools in place that can take data in and be able to um, normalize data from different payment sources so that it's not just about the you know individual data sets anymore it's about the collective of data you can then start to have that more proactive seat where instead of dealing with one of those symptoms in a reactive way you can sit there from a seat of of a, a more proactive strategic advisor to the business right that's the that's the shift that I'm 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 hoping that we can start to um, enable as we we look to um, help organizations transfer um, from the, that role of the service provider to strategic advisor is in this notion of taking data to eliminate the firefighting, eliminate the reactive nature of some of these um, symptoms that we're dealing with or the questions we get from leadership to be able to more proactively say, you know, this is why we're getting paid slow and here are the steps we could take to eliminate that before it even becomes an issue. There's a lot of good points that you made, Pat. And, and I'll give a, I'll give an example of Sometimes we think um, if we make the process more end-to-end, -end, better information, how is that going to make people pay faster? They're going to pay when things are due. And I think that's I think that's a fair question to ask, but I also think it's helpful to think through, um, you know, one of the first times we did a study of, um, you know, payments, accounts receivable, uh, day sales outstanding, we looked at those items that had had defects from the shipping side or from the invoicing side and the, the items that had defects, what was the DSO on those? It was massive. It wasn't like a week or two later, it was just enormous. Um, and let's say terms were, I think terms were almost exclusively net 30 at this particular company. Um, their, uh, their DSO was, was over 42. And just working on the small percentage of invoices, shipments that created these defects, fixing those, you know, saved seven days of DSO out of, out of, you know, 40, uh, you know, 42 days, a little over 42 days, DSO was brought down to 35. Now the terms were net 30, but just fixing the problems had a disproportionately large effect on liquidity. And, and those defects have a disproportionately large effect on inefficiency and how that involves people and staff and time. So those are really, really good points you're making, Pat. And I, you know, sometimes we don't think about the, the reverberations of what does an error do? What does missing information do on both sides and how that you know, creates more time, which is inefficient, lack of scalability, slow pay. So whether you love, um, your accounts receivable numbers, whether you're a treasury uh, person who focuses on liquidity, there's this feedback loop on, on all of these areas. So thanks, thanks for your comments. And that brings us to our second poll question, uh, integrating data and systems. Are you moving towards rationalization to integrate data and systems to make sure that it passes through systems, it's handled and managed? Um, are you working to do that? Um, or is, it there, is there a handoff where data is lost? Um, in the chat box, uh, at this point, we just need, uh, we have 147 people typing the word deluxe or pull. We just need three. I won't say anything more about it because I know 
we're already past it now. So that's good. No need to type anything in that box. And I'll let Brian post some information about connecting with us on LinkedIn, uh, connecting with Deluxe and collect, collect, connecting with Strategic Treasure. All right. So this is, again, the poll question is a single choice answer. And go ahead and select the one you want. We have enough of those in the side box of no need to type those. Save, save your hands and fingers and carpal tunnel syndrome until next webinar. All right. Pat, this is uh, the rationalization move. We currently there, a third, slightly more. We plan to. No plans to 9%, unsure 23%. Any, uh, any advice, um, shock, concern, delight from this? Yeah, no, I I I think this probably sits where where I thought it would, right? And I I I think a lot about the level of effort and undertaking um that you have to invest in as a business to um to really transform this and and it can be a, a pretty big um hill to climb and so you know I, I i definitely um you know like i said in the previous poll i get excited to see you know that a third of a third of you all are, are currently um working on that or currently there and you know a, a third know that this is you know on your on your radar um and and what I would say is for the folks that you know are unsure or don't have plans to, um, you know, I think that there's even some small things that you can do, and I, uh, you know, in, in some of the um, next steps and, and takeaways, you know, we we can share a little bit there. But you know, I, what I would say is. Um, the the opportunity to um be able to take advantage of your data is becoming more and more available and technology is becoming better and better so there will be um you know there will be opportunities for you all if, if this mountain or this hill is 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 too steep right now um you know technology is going to continue to evolve and continue to become easier to adopt and um put these systems in place to uh, better enable your data you know i think about just how much technology has changed you know in just the past five years um you know especially you know thinking about some of the artificial intelligence stuff that's out there, um, you know, barely, you know, being talked about, uh, you know, as as commercially available five years ago. Now it's it's everywhere you look, and you know, I, I think so much of that is also based in in data and our ability to uh, have the tools to manage data. So I think that there's a wave of you know, this AI revolution that is going to also revolutionize the tools that we have for capturing, storing, accessing, enabling data as well. So it's exciting to see folks that are already there planning on doing it. And for the folks that, you know, aren't, aren't quite sure yet, you know, there's, um, uh, you know, I think the future is bright for the capabilities that um, we can all leverage to take advantage of our data in new ways. All right. I think this slides you too. Yeah. Well, this this is where I spend most of my time these days. So, <laughs> uh, you know, th this is definitely where I think about the the data problem most acutely um in in the cash application space and you know uh, everybody I'm sure everybody knows deluxe right you know the when we are processing payments for um 
as a, as a lockbox provider, right? A lot of times that check and a copy of the invoice or in the envelope sent together, we can, um, you know, post that payment, match that, apply that cash, uh, and, and sort of complete that transaction. But we all know that that, um, payment method is, is declining in use, more digital methods are out there. The landscape is going to continue to evolve um, in terms of payment acceptance. And what I what I often think about here is, you know, from a, a business standpoint, the flexibility to allow customers to pay um, how they want to pay, right? And, and lower the friction on the front end of that payment happening is an enticing um, piece of, of the sort of get paid part of um, the cash conversion cycle. But what it ends up doing is takes all of that friction out of the front end and puts it on the back end. <laughs> it takes all of the mess of, you know, dealing with how do we get this payment and the lack of data that it's coming with to match the open invoice or whatever um, is in your uh, ERP or accounting system or whatever you're using to uh, be able to apply that cash and, um, you know, be able to then reinvest it back in the business and, and, um, and all that, that good stuff. But at the end of the day, this is where the data challenge can be most acutely felt because any time that you don't have the tools in place to capture that data along with that, that payment, it's going to turn into a ton of manual work to figure out what that payment was for. And back to um, you know some of the, the customer research that, that I've done, one of the things that really stuck with me, um, I spent a lot of time talking to uh, accounts receivable specialists who were you know, doing cash application as a, as a big part of their job. And you know, they would they would call themselves cash detectives, right? They would be out there, you know, trying to take this payment and figure out where it came from, right? And that is not only a ton of time and effort, it's manual work. So it's error prone, right? It's costly. There's a lot of, you know, those impacts that can be felt across the business. And really the reason why that job that um that function is required that that job to be done of matching you know the payment to the the invoice manually is because the data is not there so when we think about ways to um to you know pinpoint opportunities to um leverage data to continue to um you know figure out ways to capture more data it this is one of the areas that i look at a lot because it um it in a perfect world it should be automatic right in a perfect world 100% of payments coming in would be automatically matched to the data that is uh, on file for on that particular payer we all know that that's a hundred percent is is a is a, a a very distant reality, if if ever um, going to be a reality. But that's where you know companies can find opportunities to better streamline this process, to better um, make sure that customers who are paying do the, you know, even if it's, you know, steps that aren't the most technologically savvy steps, there's things that your customers can do to make sure that that information is, is accompanying the payment somehow. There's opportunities to use new tools from a cash application standpoint to better track um, 
pay your history so that you can make that next payment happen easier and faster. So those things are not necessarily massive data projects, but they are things that you know teams can start to take on to again, better use data um, and not just have to deal payment by payment, you know, remittance by remittance, whatever is um, you know, sort of coming in on a day-to-day -day basis, take a step back and be able to apply different techniques to make sure that, again, eliminating this manual work then frees you up for some of those more strategic um, opportunities. Great. Now that brings us over to forecasting from cash application to forecasting. Um, this uh, this chart, you know, you look at the buyer and the seller, they're related one to another. Um, the seller's like, I have no visibility to when you're going to pay me. Um, I have to provide numbers to Treasury, to the the head of uh, accounts receivable or or the credit the credit uh, manager. Um, what does that do? So it creates all these issues of, um, you know, can I, uh, what do I need to do to hit my numbers for uh, for cash allocation? Am I uh, going to have to spend having more time with people calling to do individual follow-up, the inefficient process? Um, am I exposed to greater risk because maybe we're not getting paid because we don't see it? And so now we're going to be um, just extend that, or if we perhaps it's just because we don't know. And this this leads to a loss of business opportunities. When we move down and we see, we can see when things are going, the buyer indicates the seller, for example, and shares that we're going to send value on March 30th. I guess we probably should have said March 29th because March 30th is a Saturday. Um, and we're going to probably keep it to a banking day, but I'm going to send value on 330. Now I know it's coming. I can put that in as a known item on my forecast. I don't need to call and follow up. Um, now I can have greater confidence in a larger percentage of my forecasted number because they're scheduled numbers. And so this is a lack of data makes life hard for both parties. Even if you're the buyer or the payer, um, you have another counterparty's like, hey, are you gonna pay us? Um, it's like, is it going to be late? Uh, when is it going to come in? You're getting involved and I'll say uh, interacted with, with a defective process where there's a defect, someone reaches out to you to gather that information. And so there's response. I mean, you might ignore a few calls or emails, but eventually you're going to need to respond. And so that creates inefficiencies on both sides. So forecasting, better data, more data means both parties uh, are more efficient. Um, and can plan and manage their capital environment much better. So that's that's at least a start on this. Um, Pat, I, you know, your comments on this too. Yeah, no, I think you said it well. And I, I think what I would add is the ability for um, you all to have that line of sight is what we continually hear one of the biggest pain points that's out there today um so i think that as we you know start to see data being used in in new and different ways the gap in the ability to forecast is one of those things that is going to be at the top of the list for a lot of um a lot of companies to solve a lot of folks in treasury to solve um because i i see it time and time again as one of the biggest pain points and again it's due to you know while we may be looking end to end we may have all the systems in place to provide the reports for each one of their steps in the process, the ability to then pull all that data together to have an accurate representation of forecasting, to be able to, you know, conduct different 
scenario generation, right? If we were to give a discount for people to pay sooner, what would happen, right? Like those types of opportunities, I think are right at your fingertips if you're able to connect to, you know, connect the data sources from all of your different tools. Um, and again, that gets to the, that role of strategic advisor to be able to come in and say, hey, hey, look, you know, it may, you know, be, we may get um, less money per customer, but the amount that we can invest because we've got, you know, payments happening faster, will make up for that shortcoming from a customer payment side. Like all of a sudden you can have a, a, a different dialogue than just, you know, reporting on a, you know, day sales outstanding and, you know, some things that um, are the key contributors to it. It's about, um, to Craig's point, what are the things that are actually happening behind all of that, that when connected, paint a different picture. And I think that's where tools from a forecasting standpoint are going to become more readily available for the organizations that have that data in a way that can be leveraged. All right, that brings us to our third and final poll question. This one is multiple choice. You can select more than one. Select the one that uh, is appropriate um, or the multiples that are appropriate. The last choice is none of the above. The question is the following is true or mostly true of our organization's forecasting. We forecast cash flows, yes or no. We perform variance analysis manually. Um, we have more than one forecast model. We perform variance analysis systematically or automatically. We use AI and machine learning or machine learning to support our forecast or none of the above. Go ahead and type those in. We don't need anything else in the chat box to pass those out. We're well over the 150. I think we might be at the 180. While that's coming up, there was a question about what is the consumer retail check volume what is the consumer retail check writing decline you are seeing? Is this around 15% year over year? Um, I don't know if you know that number off the top of your head, Pat. I'm going to say I don't think it's 15% per year. It's it's a solid decline each year now, but it's I don't think it's 15%, but you may know the, yeah, I don't, the actual I numbers. Yeah, I don't number off the top of my head, so we'll, we'll have to okay. back. If someone, if someone knows that... Uh, the specific number, not a guess. Feel free to type it in the chat box just to uh, to share that information broadly. Well, now since hopefully all of you have submitted your answers for the question about forecasting, what we do, we'll look at the responses. Four out of five forecast cash flows. Five out of ten perform variance analysis manually. Two out of four, two out of five have more than one forecast model. Um, there's a systematic uh, process for variance analysis with over a quarter of companies. One out of eleven now use AI or machine learning to support their forecast. This might be the most interesting set of answers, Pat. Yeah, yeah, and I and I I love um, the AI and, and ML um group there that to see that at um 10 percent is um again just it, it's great to see because i i think there can be a pretty big um apprehension in adopting some of those capabilities um and a, a inability to trust that those AI or ML tools are gonna get it right. Um, and and I, I hear that loud and clear. Um, and I and I think that that's where you know there are some AI tools out there that uh, definitely work better than others. Um, I also think that this is where you know that that garbage in garbage out uh, phrase really rings true is, you know, there's a um, 
you know, there's a very real uh, benefit to the technology that exists today to synthesize large amounts of data and be able to do some of that heavy lifting so that you all can, you know, focus on the things that really require, you know, those, those human skills of creative thinking and, you know, um, problem solving and, and things like that, that AI can't do. So I'm excited to see that it's, it's already showing up here. I'm excited for the future of what that holds. And, and my advice to you all is, you know, you know, it doesn't have to be in a work setting. I would advise just start using some of those tools. Um, I have ChatGPT on my phone and uh, I use it quite a bit outside of work for, um, you know, whether it's coming up with different recipes for the week or uh, whatever the case may be. I, I would encourage you all to start using it to start to get more comfortable with it um, because I think that that's gonna be more and more prevalent um and the technology is moving really fast so that's my my two cents on that <laughs> great uh, excellent so now we're to uh, calibration what's most important to improving forecasts i think you'll start us off i'll, I'll probably add in a few things as you know yeah and I, I know we've only got you know nine minutes left and so i, I want to make sure we can um get to some of those next steps and and closing thoughts but you know, I think that this is going to depend on your goals as a business. This is going to be about what is the biggest pain point that you're trying to solve for um, and, and focusing on that. You know, one of the things that, um, you know, I bet you all are looking at this slide and saying yes to all of these things, right? <laughs> well, these are all things that we want to be able to solve for. Um, they're all critical pieces that are going to um, drive our ability to, to do the types of forecasting that we need to. But if you're feeling gaps in, in any or all of these areas, I think it's important to find the ones that feel like they would provide the biggest impact to the business first, focus on how to um, you know, drive uh, change within one of those problem spaces and build on success within that, right? Um, that can help teams get started when feeling like this is a really big task. And then as we think about next steps, I, I'll I'll, I'll kind of hit on the the top row there, and and really with the the first two uh, most specifically, um, I think we have to be really good at quantifying the problem um, as we look to you know grow investment in um, the tools or capabilities that are needed to enable that data for forecasting. Um, and one of the, the recommendations I have is to take a look at the sort of data journey, right? If you think about that end-to-end -end, um, process that we talked about earlier, what's the data flow look like? Where are their handoffs? What is it, you know, if, if you were an individual uh, payment, how does that data flow through? If you were, you know, an email from a customer, with some remittance information, how does that eat? How does that data flow through? Um, and what having a visual does is it allows you to see where the gaps are. It allows you to, you know, have more specific conversations. And what I'll say is, the scarier the diagram looks, the better your case can be, right? <laughs> you know, if it's a it's it's a spider web of you know how this data flows between systems and where there's gaps between systems, those are the, the spaces where you can start to identify and quantify what that gap actually means. Um, and so it's not just, you know, the end to end, you know, covering all the systems in place. It's looking at how does the data actually flow from system to system that you can then start to tell a story to the, 
you know, leaders of the business to say, hey, we need to solve this problem. And here's what this problem with our data actually contributes um, or how this impacts the business in a negative way. I'll make one comment on the bottom right, tools for forecasting. Um, you know, there's tools that are created to help capture the information, track it, um, you know, whether it's using artificial intelligence and machine learning or whether it's just uh, capturing summary information and doing uh, running averages or smooth averages or something less sophisticated. Vendors provide those types of tools. Uh, you know, vendors, uh, you know, certainly like Deluxe, have uh, lots of data in them, ability to help support that. Uh, I'll mention banks. Uh, there's a recent article put out on CTM file. Maybe Brian can drop that into the, the chat box about uh, one of the trillion-dollar banks building in uh, forecasting capabilities within their portal and leveraging that uh, and 2,500 clients are now using that. So uh, really, really pretty interesting thoughts there. And plus there's others uh, as well. Some companies build that themselves. Um, that brings us to our final um, slide, our final thoughts. Uh, this is a, a recap of some of the ideas that we've been sharing. And I'll let you go first. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think, you know, one of the things with the, headline there, data is a new currency. One of the things I like to think about there is actually kind of in, in those terms, right? If you think about, you know, personal finances, right? Where you might have, you know, a couple savings accounts and, you know, money sitting in those savings accounts, right? That's not really doing much for you. You take that money and put it in an investment account. Now you can watch that money grow. It's, it's you know, working for you. Um, data is the same way, right? If you have data that's just sort of siloed off, um, you know, it's going to create gaps. It's not going to allow you to take advantage of um, the entirety of the data set you have access to. So, it, you know, data in silos creates gaps. Consolidated data creates opportunities. So I, I think about it, you know, in... in where you can start to transition from some of the old ways of, of managing data to some of the new ways, start small, find spaces that um, make sense and are attainable. If, you know, taking off, you know, the biting off the whole apple is too much, um, you know, what, what, let's, let's take some smaller steps and, um, you know, start to move in that direction because, the companies that are doing that will be better off. All right, and to, to summarize, the, the last uh, pillar here is the end-to-end -end view. Um, you know, what's, what's the cleanest way of doing things? Make sure that when you send payments that you're also including data. Even if someone can't use it in the same channel, maybe you're emailing them or sending it a separate way, but include them with the payments allows for the best uh, you know, cash application and communication with other uh, parties in the, the, the cycle. Taking that end-to-end -end view is the only way to reduce defects. Otherwise, you're, you're sitting there waiting for complaints and the complaints to be large enough for you to act. All of the other inefficiencies continue because maybe someone didn't speak about them. But if you're looking at end-to-end -end view, you can reduce defects as well. And so the last point here, physical supply chain, financial supply chain, data supply chain. Um, the data supply chain impacts every other part. You know, the financial supply chain is dependent upon physical and data. And the physical supply chain does not stand alone by itself. So this is the interconnected end-to-end -end view of being able to leverage uh, data, uh, taking advantage of that to uh, help your organization perform uh, from an efficiency standpoint, as well as from uh, making your data work for you. Thanks, Pat. Thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, we'll turn it back over to Brian. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. The CTP credits, today's webinar slides and a recording of today's webinar will be sent to you within five business days. And for more on how to make your data work for you, be sure to download the Treasury Tech Analyst Report by clicking the link in the chat box.
Thank you, and we hope you have a good rest of the day.